My name is Wayne Dyer, and um, I'm 72 years old, and, uh, and I have sex almost every day. Almost on Monday, almost on Tuesday, almost... Anyway, that was Jack LaLanne's opening for 20 years until he was 94 years old. So I borrowed it from him. It was the signature story of my life that just blew me away in terms of connecting to spirit. I've never experienced anything like this before. I finished writing Inspiration, Your Ultimate Calling, on the 20. 3rd of April. And I knew that the book was going to uh, have 18 chapters in it, because 18 is that magical number, one infinite source, one infinite source. I put that number uh, on on my dashboard of my car, I have it on the mirror, It's it's a reminder, one infinite source, 18. It's the number of chapters in the Bhagavad Gita. It's the number of holes on a golf course. It's got to have something. (laughs) And um, so I had 17 chapters written. And I was thrilled to have that completed. But I still had one chapter to go. But I was holding that off until my birthday on the 10th of May. And so, and I knew what that last chapter was going to be. My experience of, uh, of living an inspired life. Just telling it on my birthday, right around 3.13 or so in the morning. (laughs) So I was essentially done. And I went for a walk that day, and when I finished that chapter, that 17th chapter, I told a story in there about my friend Jack Bolin. He passed away about 12 years ago. Jack was a unity minister in Detroit. A man who, when I wrote Your Erroneous Owns three decades ago, called me up and asked me if he could put together some tapes on it and would I give him permission and he was he had started a unity church over on the east side of Detroit and asked me if he could use that I said absolutely I have no and over the years I began to speak at his church and his congregation and come to Detroit a lot my home and we became very close we became like brothers and um, he got very sick and he had uh, cancer throughout his back and so on and I went with him to my friend Deepak Chopra's place the Ayurveda Center out in Massachusetts during the day we would go out and then in the evening he would come in and Jack always had to have a story it had to, he had to tell a story and, and he started to, he t- talking to me about these wonderful little creatures called monarch butterflies and how much he loved them and, and the reason that he loved them he said Wayne these are the most amazing little things in the world I mean they've got a brain the size of a pinprick just no brain essentially and they're made out of tissue paper you know like toilet paper they're just flimsy little things and they come out and they're they come out of a, a chrysalis on the, on, the uh, on a branch in a tree in, uh, in Brazil now they're They don't have a brain and they're made out of toilet paper, (laughs) essentially. And they fly to Nova Scotia, 1,385 miles away. And they spend some time there doing whatever you do in Nova Scotia if you're a monarch butterfly. (laughs) And then they turn around, these pinprick brain toilet paper insects, and they fly all the way back to Brazil. But not only do they go back to Brazil, they go back to the same tree. Not only do they go back to the same tree, they go back to the same branch. And they start the whole process all over again. With another cocoon. I mean, it's like, I've got a brain that's supposed to be pretty good size. I leave my cell phone (laughs) in the bedroom. I did this just the other day. And I walk out of the bedroom, I can't find my cell phone. I have to call the number on another phone, and I'm listening to this funny little sound that I'm and looking under pillows. I know it's over. I had to call twice because I didn't want to get charged for the first. Call. Well, anyway, well. and I and these things can find the same branch that they were that they came out of a cocoon on. So anyway, he would tell me about the the miracle of these things. All right, so I wrote that whole story. The, the 17th chapter is about the language of spirit, how spirit speaks to us in ways that 
we don't even, that we're not even aware of. It speaks in terms of alignments. When things align, when the same numbers appear, the same ideas keep showing up, when these, when these kinds of alignments show up. So I called my editor, Joanna, who's here tonight, um, who's edited everything I've done for the last uh, 30 years or so, and can only only person in the world who can read my handwriting. <laughs> and um, I read her the story of, the, of Jack and the Monarch Butterfly, and I called my friend, the president of Hay House, who's my publisher, who's also here tonight, Reed Tracy, my best friends in the world. And um, I read both of them the story. All right? And then, because I always do that when I finish a chapter, I read it to just see what it sounds like. Took off on my walk. It's 12.30 in the afternoon. I'm going for a walk along Kanapali Beach. And I walk and I walk and I get out to this place called Black Rock, out on West Maui. And um, I'm walking there and I'm at peace and I'm going to meditate and I got my cell phone with me and I found it. And a monarch butterfly flies right out of the tree, and I've, I don't think I've ever seen monarchs there before. Right? A monarch butterfly flies out of the tree and circles and lands right there, three feet in front of me. So I think, well, a little bit of a coincidence, but uh, you know, that's because I just wrote, I just read the whole story, just, and I reach over to pick up this butterfly, and it looks at me like, I'm a butterfly. You know, I, <laughs> I don't deal with humans. I mean, my DNA is programmed to stay away from you. And it flies away. And it goes out about 40 yards, and it makes a U-turn, and it comes back, and it lands on my finger. Right here. And I look at it, and I have never had this happen before in my life. I've had butterflies brush up against me once, but I've never had one just seek me out. So it lands here, and I immediately reached for my cell phone, <laughs> and I called Joanna, you remember, <laughs> and I said, Joanna, there's a monarch butterfly on my finger. <laughs> you know what I just read to you this morning. She said, as she always does, she's so sweet and peaceful, meditate. I said, meditate? This is a monarch butterfly. I just wrote about him and Jack and all. She said, just go meditate on him. So I call another number, and I call Reed, the president of Hay House, my buddy, all right? And I said, Reed, I read to you this morning about a monarch butterfly. I've now got one on my finger. It flew to me. He said, get a picture. I said, what are you talking about? Get a picture. I'm got my bathing suit on and a cell phone. I don't have a camera. He said, we've been thinking about what's going to be on the cover of the book. He said, this is perfect. Right away thinking about, you know, this is inspiration. This is like it's come to you for that reason. Get a picture. Get a picture. So I went, I took Joanna's advice, and I meditated. Now it's one o'clock in the afternoon when this happened, and I meditate for 30 minutes, and I called Joanna back, and I said, it's still with me. And I called Reed back. He said, get a picture. So... Now this butterfly is doing, uh, during the meditation, I, <laughs> I don't know how to say this without sounding strange, but it's, uh, it's okay because every word of this is true. I swear to you, <laughs> this butterfly was trying to talk to me. I don't know how close you've ever looked at a monarch butterfly, but it had tiny little, it had, almost like teeth, but they're not really teeth. I know they don't have teeth. <laughs> And I bring the butterfly up real close to my eye, and it's, it's doing this. Jack? Because I had just written about it. I thought it was Jack. And then I took the butterfly and I put it over by my ear. In case it was making little sounds and it had a little, you know. I, I was just totally freaked out by this thing because it's now been an hour. It's been an hour. It's now, and it won't go. It's like I take it over here, I put it over on this finger, it, it's over here, and it won't go. And I'm going, okay, you know, that was not, it won't leave. It's just connected to me. So I walk, I think, I said, maybe Reed's got a point here. Maybe we need to get a picture of this thing. So I decide to walk back to where I live. And I walk along now in the, on Maui in the afternoon, the trade winds come in and they really blow hard in the afternoon. And I'm walking, the 
The ocean is over here, the trades are coming in, and the butterfly's wings, toilet paper, are all the way bent over, but it won't leave. All the way bent, as far as it can go, and then I come back and I get out of the wind and it goes, you know, it's like flashing and making sounds, and I hold it up. So I'm walking along the beach, uh, the, the beach there, and there's a little girl, who she's about four, five, six years old, who's totally traumatized because she got the wrong color Slurpee. <laughs> that's, that's her issue, okay? <sighs> Giving her mother more grief, you know. I want to tell her about Immaculate in the bathroom. I want to tell her, you know, I, what purple? I hate purple Slurpees. Going on and on. It's real, you know. So I tap her on the shoulder. Tears are on. And I just, well, I said, uh, you want to see my pet butterfly? <laughs> I did. <laughs> she said, what's his name? What's his name? What's his name? I said, Jack. <laughs> I did. <laughs> and she went, she went from, uh, I don't know how to say this. She, she went from pissed to blissed, okay? <laughs> I, mean, I don't know if they can use that. She went from, uh, you know, being so upset to just this total state of bliss and just one second the tears dried up she smiled she wanted to know if she could take it home i said no <laughs> what are you talking about this is my butterfly <laughs> i get all the way back to where i'm going it's now about 1 30 in the afternoon about an hour and a half has gone by i <clears throat> i live in a place where they have a concierge downstairs and there's a pool there and there's a girl there her name is cindy and i i walk upstairs and i call cindy down at the pool and I said, Cindy, can you walk over to the ABC store and get a uh, portable camera and be here in uh, five minutes? She said, do you want me to come to your apartment <laughs> with a portable camera in five minutes? <laughs> I said, yes, I do. <laughs> she said, why? I said, I want you to take a picture of me and my butterfly. <laughs> she said, uh, what are you smoking? <laughs> I said, no, it's true. I found a butterfly and she does yoga and she's like one of these people. She, she said, okay. I also said, there's $100 in it for you if you can get here in five minutes. She went up there, came back. She had got one of these little cameras. I went out, sat on the lanai with the manuscript and I had 20, I think 29 pictures she got of me with the butterfly. And I was posing with it. It was like, you know, over here. My I, did, I didn't know what he wanted. I don't know what to do, but you know. <laughs> So, so uh, she went, that's the actual butterfly, truly it is. Now we had to take a different picture because those, you know, $13 cameras uh, aren't the kind you can use on photographs on books and so on. But uh, I insisted that they put Jack on my finger on this so they transposed it through, I don't know, through computers or whatever. So that's the actual butterfly. And if it flies out of there right now, I'm going to fall down. So I get back, <coughs> I had the picture, she went, took the camera in, got the pictures to develop. It's now um, around two, two o'clock in the afternoon. So it's been, or three o'clock in the afternoon. It's been two hours, right? That, but now I don't know what I'm going to do with this butterfly. What do you feed a butterfly? You know, what, uh, do I get a leash? You know, do, I, do I get a cage? Am I going to keep him? Do I, you know, get rid of him? Whatever, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do with it. But uh, I set it down on the manuscript that I had handwritten that morning. Where, it talked, where I talked about Jack and the, and the uh, um, uh, monarch butterfly, and I set it on there, figuring it maybe recognized that this is where it came from or whatever. So I had it walking around on the, and I went in, went back, took a shower, was gone, did a little meditation, did a little work, and so on. Came back, butterfly is still there, two and a half hours. And I reached down after having taken a shower, and I put my finger down there, and the butterfly looked back up at me, just like it did when I went to pick it up down here, as if to say, well, who are you and what are you doing? And I'm going to show you that I'm not sick and this isn't an accident. And it took up and it circled me and it took off straight out towards the ocean, made a circle and was gone. All right. And that's my butterfly story. And it's and what I'm suggesting to you is that you pay attention to the powerful things that show up in your life and that these things that we call coincidences and so on are much much more aligned with spirit than you may have ever thought them to be there are no accidents in a universe 
which has an organizing intelligence that supports it and creates it. And anything like this, any of these kinds of things, can be very powerful messages. It's the language of spirit speaking to you. And there's no doubt whatsoever, no matter what anybody thinks, that I don't know that that was Jag. And if you're in a place where there are no beginnings and there are no ends, and there's no north and there's no south and there's no up and there's no down, that means it's infinite and there's only one place. And if you're in a place that only has oneness in it, then it can be anywhere it wants to. That spirit can enter onto Maui on a butterfly just as easily as it can enter into uh, a, a butterfly in Brazil or any place else. There's no space, there's no place.